Hey, all right, Billy D's right here. Welcome to the podcast. I am absolutely thrilled that you are here. If you have never checked out the program before, let me tell you, we are primarily an interview and a commentary podcast. We're going to be talking today about a couple things. I'm going to talk a little bit about science, some things here going on recently that in my opinion are pretty interesting. We're also going to talk about quiet quitting. Hmm, what about that? What is up with that? Where do people come up with these terms? And we're also going to talk a little bit about another person who has gone down to cancel culture. And that is Andrew Tate. All that coming up on the Billy D's podcast. Don't forget. You can follow me on Twitter. Real easy to find at Billy D's. All right. I've always been very much, very much a fan of the space sciences and, you know, astrophysics, physics, all that stuff. Newton, Kepler, all that stuff. Uh, Einstein, of course, I eat all that stuff up. And I ran across a, a news story here recently about a sound being recorded from a black hole. And I wasn't exactly sure what that meant, if they were referring to some sort of radio wave or something, because I wasn't sure about the term sound. But it turns out that there is a sonic reference for this sound coming from a black hole. Now, this information that I'm going to give you is from NASA's website. Now, this comes from a black hole, which is at the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. Okay, and astronomers discovered that pressure waves sent out by the black hole caused ripples in the cluster's hot gas that could be translated into a note, one that humans cannot hear some 57 octaves below middle C. Now, a new sonification brings more notes to this black hole sound machine, this new sonification that is a translation of astronomical data into sound is being released for NASA's black hole week this year. In some ways, the sonification is like other none before because it revisits the actual sound waves discovered in data from NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Hmm, sounds mighty fancy there, doesn't it? The popular misconception is that there is no sound in space. And this originates because the fact is, is that most of space is essentially a vacuum providing no medium for sound waves to, you know, travel through. A galaxy cluster, on the other hand, has copious amounts of gas that envelop the hundreds or even thousands of galaxies within it, providing a medium for the sound waves to travel. Hmm, now that's getting interesting, now, isn't it? In this new sonification, the sound waves astronomers previously identified were extracted and made audible for the first time. The sound waves were extracted in radial directions, meaning outward from the center. The signals were then resynthesized into the range of human hearing by scaling them upward by 57 and 58 octaves above their true pitch. Now, for me as a novice in this type of science, I'm not exactly sure if you were out there floating around <laughs> what you would hear, but nonetheless, nonetheless, I find this very fascinating. I'm going to play a little bit for you. This is the sound that they came up with from the black hole, kind of scary and kind of cool. Another NASA space-related news. I got to tell you, finally, there is a mission that is being aimed at the moon. Now, this is exciting. You know, I, I know a lot of people ask, why has it been so long since we went back? And quite frankly, sadly, there just has not been public support 
and uh, governmental support. We really haven't had a president, for example, really spearhead space since Kennedy. So I, I'm really, you know, this has been a source of frustration for me for a long time because so much of our world, the knowledge that we have, the technology that we have, whether it be microprocessors, whether it be GPS, whether it be aerodynamics, bone density, all kinds of stuff about the human body, all kinds of ways to fight fire, weather prediction, all of these things were so greatly improved by the space program. Even if you aren't necessarily excited about going to another world, it's the idea that this is part of our evolution as a species, our knowledge and our understanding of our existence, which by the way, People always kind of feel that the earth is the place and it is a very important place, but it is not our world. Our world does not stop at the top of the atmosphere. We are impacted every day by the forces of space and it is so important. But anyway, according to the NASA press secretary, Artemis 1 will be an uncrewed flight test that will provide a foundation for deep space exploration and demonstrate our commitment to extend human existence to the moon and to Mars. Now, this launch will be coming up here will be increasingly complex, part of an increasingly complex set of missions that will culminate with a manned moon landing planned for 2025. NASA has said the Artemis missions will include the first woman and the first person of color to land on the moon. Again, this mission is unmanned and will begin Monday the 29th, if all goes well. And the mission will take 42 days, 3 hours, 20 minutes to complete. According to NASA, the Orion spacecraft is set for splashdown near Baja, California, after it returns from orbiting the moon, and this will be on October 10th. Okay, now to me, again, this whole thing to me is very exciting. I don't understand why this isn't a bigger news story than what it is. Of course, here again, we live in a world where people are still debating whether the original Apollo missions even happened. And now, and they're not a fringe group anymore. They used to be. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that question the shape of the earth. The flat earthers have gained momentum and the whole debate on whether or not the earth is round. Now, we all know that it's a triangle, <laughs> but anyway, you get my point, right? Uh, so this is, we've actually gone backwards in a lot of ways in terms of our knowledge of space. And to me, that is incredibly sad the one hope that I, I, I've always had about the exploration of space is that it would make us aware of our own fragile humanity. You know, we're floating around on this little rock uh, and we, hey, we should have a lot more in common than what we always choose to separate and divide ourselves. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened either. So I'm hoping for the best as we move forward. And I'm very excited about this later, latest NASA mission to the moon. You are listening to the Billy D's podcast. All right. Have you run across this term yet? Quiet quitting. <laughs> Quiet quitting, you know, that's kind of one of those terms somewhere like maybe the main office of BS somewhere like in Scranton. And every once in a while, they, they issue some new term that makes its way into the common vernacular of today's society. How does that sound? Now, I've, I've researched this a little bit. I'm going to talk about what it is and what the proponents of it say about it and then kind of what the other side says about it, why they say maybe it's not a good idea, and then I'll give you my take on it. But anyway, quiet quitting is a recent workplace phenomenon where employees are rejecting the idea of going above and beyond at work. 
Now, this kind of took off after a recent TikTok video went viral. Now, proponents of this say that despite how it sounds, I know it sounds really bad, shouldn't go above and beyond at work. It sounds bad, but they say what it really means is it's setting healthy boundaries to establish work-life balance. And the practice of quiet quitting, sometimes, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's very similar and has many things in common with other strategies to improve your mental health. And it very well might, as everybody who listens to this show regularly knows, I am very much an advocate for mental health. Now, that doesn't mean that every time mental health is mentioned, it's in conjunction with something that is really helpful. Sometimes mental health just gets mentioned to give it credence. So let's kind of examine this a little bit and find out where we go. One of the arguments for quiet quitting is that it kind of prevents burnout. And this can frequently result from doing work that doesn't necessarily align with our values or when we feel we are being held back from from really uh, doing something meaningful in the workplace or in the community. And for a long time, people just said, well, you know what? It's work. That's why it's called work. And you're not necessarily supposed to enjoy it. I mean, that's what people say. But is that really part of the way we should be considering work? Is this attitude part of an era that no longer exists? Well, proponents say quiet quitting helps you strategically disengage from burnout because it keeps you from overextending yourself and sacrificing your well-being. But wait, there's more quiet quitting also helps us set healthy boundaries. The way we set our priorities and create a work-life balance is to promote healthy boundaries and say, hey, this is where I draw the line. This is unacceptable. And I won't do this if you want me on board. Setting healthy boundaries for better work-life balance may mean not taking your work home with you, not checking messages outside of work hours, not attending non-required work events like, you know, the who knows what that they're having down the street after work to help raise money for some kind of crap you don't give a damn about, right? And not working more than the number of hours you were hired to work. All right, fair enough. Setting boundaries at work makes it easier to pursue side hustles or hobbies, spend more time with loved ones, and protect our mental and physical health. Sounds great, right? All right, well, let's move on. Quiet quitting builds a sense of control. When you believe you have control over your life, you have what is called an internal locus of control. When you believe you can't influence what happens to you, that outside and random forces are responsible for how your life turns out, you have an external locus of control. Focusing on things outside of your control increases stress frustration and feelings of helplessness. It's one of those things where, you know, you just feel like you're stuck in a rut. Quiet quitting is a strategy to exert your power over what is within your control by arriving on time, doing your job, then clocking out to go home and fill your life with meaningful connections and activities. All right, I'll give you one more. Quiet quitting helps you prioritize what matters You know, we've had the great resignation and with uh, COVID-19 and all of these other things, people have been reevaluating things and many people have shifted their priorities. They've had to take a hard look at what really matters and what doesn't. You know, let's face it, your kids won't be kids forever. You have other people in your life you want to spend time with, whether it's your dear friends or your parents, your brothers and sisters. And you know what? Nobody lives forever. You have to cherish these relationships and make time for them. Okay. All of that is well understood. I totally agree with all of these concepts. I have been, like I mentioned, a mental health advocate for a long time and also someone who believes that you should enjoy life to the fullest at 
at every moment you can. I'm absolutely on board with all of this. What I don't understand is why we had to create yet another term, quiet quitting, to discuss and debate and raise a ruckus over because all of these concepts are well understood. For example, in regard to burnout, the concept of a wellness break has been going on for a long time in my circles. And not only do wellness breaks not detract from your workflow, they actually help it. Okay, it's good for the employee to take a wellness break, whether that person wants to go outside and get some fresh air or sit in the car, listen to their favorite song, whatever. It's good for them. And it's also good for the workflow because they come back rejuvenated. They can get a fresh start and continue on with their morning or their afternoon or what have you. And a wellness break is something that's important, not only when you are at work, working for other people, but it's good for yourself. I myself have had a hard time understanding that. You know, I'm one of those people when I start on a project around the house or whatever, I will, <laughs> I will get frustrated and I will work until I drop. All right. And the fact of the matter is sometimes, you know what, I know you want to get this done. It's getting late in the day, but you know what, you're getting frustrated. It's time to take a break. Chill out, as, as they used to say back in the day, right? And just regroup and continue on. All right. Setting healthy boundaries. Again, is this really a new concept? The idea that you need to put a placeholder in certain areas of your work environment. Okay, this is a, a point that I will not go beyond. This is pushing myself too much or I'm letting someone else push me too much and this is where it stops. This is not new. And I got to tell you that setting boundaries is not only important at work, okay, but it's important in every aspect of your life with your friends, with your family. And I got to tell you, you know, this whole idea of blood is thicker than water. Family members will drain every drop at times if you let them. And you have to be able to say, hey, I understand we're family. I understand you need this or you need that, but I cannot do this every single day. I cannot be called upon to be the person who always, uh, you know, has to come through for you. Okay. You have to be able to set boundaries in every aspect of your life, your personal relationships and so on. It's not just at work. Setting boundaries, again, not really a new concept here. All right, getting into building a sense of control and uh, prioritizing what matters. Again, not exactly new concepts. It's not a new concept to say that we have to, in terms of control, concentrate on things that we can influence the outcome on. Things that are beyond the scope of our control, we should only put so much worry and so much concern into them. When you lose control of, of this type of uh, workflow and how you manage things, you are setting yourself up for a lot of frustration and stress. Now, these things are easier said than done. Okay, they are much easier said than done. And when we start to feel them spin out of control, that's when we need to talk to someone. Sometimes uh, a person in our life is a great person to talk to. And sometimes just having someone listen can mean the world. And if, if need be, sometimes if we can't control this, this aspect that we worry too much about things that may or may not ever happen, then maybe we need to talk to someone who's a professional and can help you set these, uh, this criteria to make sure you're focusing on things that you can make better yourself and you can put your energy into something constructive. And here again, prior to, uh, prioritizing what matters, this kind of goes along with that. Uh, and it extends beyond the workplace. You know, there's only so much time in the day. And even when it comes to things that you enjoy doing, sometimes you can only do so many of them. So I know in my case, I've had a hard time learning that. And what I really had to do was, okay, I can't do all 10 of these things, but I can do three of them extremely well. And that's going to give me a great deal of satisfaction. And that's where you have to put your energy in. And here again, this is much easier said than done. 
my whole point in going through all of this is these are not new concepts. These are things that we should have been practicing all along. And I'll tell you what, if if the whole thing about coming up with these new terms like quiet quitting, if it gets us to talk about these things more often, then fine. I'm all on board with it because we need to remind ourselves about these things all the time. But, uh, you know, for the most part, this concept of quiet quitting, I get it. Uh, it's a nice buzzword on, on the Internet right now. It's a great social media concept. So there it is. But these are things that all along should be very much a foundation of how we are managing ourselves. All right. The latest cancel culture episode is Andrew Tate. You may or may not know who he is. I don't want to go into a lengthy description of who he is other than to say that he's, you know, a social media personality, podcaster, and he was a professional fighter. And he started to gain a lot of traction by giving counter opinions to a lot of the uh, feminist uh, movements, a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, the political correctness. He started speaking in a very positive way about uh, masculine, menly type things. And I'm sure there's people out there that would tell me he said some things that were over the line that may or may not be true. I tried to find some of his long form commentary and I can't do that because, uh, well, he was canceled. And that's the problem I have with this cancel culture. Someone has made the decision for me. Before I could go into a deep dive on this and really investigate it myself, somebody has already told me, you don't need to hear this. That's the problem with cancel culture. Now, I know as you peel the onion, a lot of people, free speech, this is, gets kind of delicate because free speech is actually a governmental thing in the United States that guards against governmental censorship doesn't really apply here a lot of these platforms facebook instagram and these these things that have canceled him they're private entities okay the only problem is and this is something we need to address maybe in terms of government and in terms of our society these some of these platforms are becoming such large powerful monopolies that they are becoming the uh, essentially the de facto place where The public discourse happens because there is no alternative. And this is tough because, again, someone made the decision for me before I could check out, you know, this person and and give them an evaluation of my own. Silencing people, it uh, does a lot of bad things. It's it's for one thing, the idea of what hate speech is can be very subjective. And that's why, with the exception of something that is clearly over the line, like inciting violence or what have you, speech that we don't like or offensive, that's the whole purpose of the concept of free speech, no matter how you apply it, whether it's to these platforms or or what have you. Because as soon as what you ever you are saying starts to get labeled as hate speech, then that, you know, opens the gate to you being silenced. So we have to tolerate a lot of unpleasantness to make sure that the good messages get out there. The other thing that disturbs me about what happened to Andrew Tate is, and here again, not him necessarily specifically, but this trend now. We got we to gotta shut down the dialogue that doesn't fit the narrative, the wider narrative. When you start silencing people, in a particular group that have a certain way of speaking or what have you. What happens is, is when you oppress a group like that, it is a breeding ground for radicalism. Free speech is also a pressure valve. It lets the steam off when, when some group wants to go out in the middle of the, uh, you know, town square and to stand on a soapbox and get all their frustrations out. They go home and they feel like they've accomplished something. They've let that steam off. But when they're told they have to stay in their house and shut up, now their motivations turn elsewhere. 
And one final thing I want to say about this is that there is a, a, a typically there's been a natural swing. You know, it, there's kind of like Newton's law of physics. Uh, any action is met by an equal and opposite reaction. So when we have things like the feminist movement rise, then, you know, it, it gets really powerful for a while. It reaches a crescendo and then the other side comes up and they have their moment and then it dies down and then the pendulum swings back the other way. And there's usually over time, the pendulum swinging back and forth, it eventually finds a center. That's how it's meant to work. But now that balance is being thrown off because when the pendulum sing, swings to the side that we don't like, we cancel it. So I, th this is a, a subject that concerns me. Here again, your feelings about Andrew Tate aside. I don't like anyone being silenced. I don't care if it's Andrew Tate I don't care if it's Louis Farrakhan. I don't care who it is. I want all of these people to be able to speak. Okay. And interestingly, there is a podcast organization that I'm actually part of the community on. I don't go to a lot of their events, but I just found out that uh, this podcast community was having an event and they actually apologized or they had some, I don't know what it is, words of regret about Ben Shapiro. Uh, being there. Now, actually, whether you agree with Ben Shapiro or not, he's he, he he's hardly someone that I would say is a threat. This is getting out of control. You know, someone who disagrees with you, someone who has an opinion that is directly opposed to yours is not a threat. You know, barring something crazy, obviously, I'm, we can't allow people to encourage violence or act out in, in a violent manner or in some other way that's over the top. But as long as it's it, they're articulating their opinion and there's people who want to hear that opinion, why do we need why do we have the need now to feel that we need to interfere in this process? You know, free speech is fundamental to any successful society. If, if, if you check out some of the Middle Eastern countries or even in Russia, some of these places where people cannot voice their consent, change is very slow in coming. But the medicine that free speech provides, this medicine sometimes is a little bitter. Okay, it, it doesn't always taste good to everybody, but the medicine is vital for everyone. And I, I don't know how we're going to navigate some of these private entities who have become monopolies and have become the de facto public forums for free speech. I, I, I'm not sure how we get through that, but we, the public and social media, is becoming Big Brother. Big Brother was originally an oppressive type of, you know, government of some kind, but it's it's becoming us. We are becoming the mob that is the public and the mob on social media. And we are determining what is hate speech. We are determining what is favorable and what is not. And we are controlling what is being said. And I feel that's a very dangerous road to go down. And we have to find a solution. These uh, cancels are, I mean, they're astonishing because once one major platform does it, they all seem to follow. It, it, it's like it's coordinated almost. And the person doesn't even have a chance to defend themselves and, and go out and explain themselves because they've been canceled. So... This latest episode with Andrew Tate, um, I really hope that we find a better way of having a public discourse that is manageable. And I feel that this should be a priority for us as a society. I mean, to me, this is at the top of the list in terms of what is happening in our society right now. And it's not only in the United States, but it's around the world. 
I mean, we we probably have one of, of, of in terms of political correctness, we're probably one of the hot spots for it, us in the UK, but it's all over. And pretty soon there's only going to be one narrative and just a lot of bad things are going to happen in terms of freedom overall. If we don't get a handle on what's happening with this cancel culture, it's more than just a buzz term now. Okay. So this is how we've begun now to have to tiptoe around how we want to express ourselves. In my opinion, uh, you know, free speech is part of the free market of ideas and it self-regulates. It's, that's the way it should work. Concepts that aren't good, people that don't have good ideas ultimately don't get listened to. It's just like turning them off. And this free market of ideas is what's supposed to work. And right now we have too many people that are tampering with the controls. They are guiding the outcome. And that's my opinion on that. I'm Billy Dees, and I'll tell you what, you can find me on Twitter. And if you would like to tweet me, you certainly can, at Billy Dees on Twitter. You can also find the Billy Dees podcast. Uh, a lot of times people run across these podcasts on various platforms. I'm not sure how that happens, but just to let you know, you can find the Billy Dees on your favorite podcasting platform as well. And that includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, and with friends over at Good Pods. I'm Billy Dees, and I will talk to you again very soon. I'm Billy Dees and host of the self-titled podcast, The Billy Dees Podcast. We are primarily an interview and a commentary-based podcast featuring authors and creators talking about their craft, advocates for community issues, and myself and an array of co-hosts discussing current events. There's no partisan ranting and raving going on here, just great content. You can find The Billy Dees Podcast on your favorite platform and on Twitter at Billy Dees. Thank you, and I hope you listen in.